Why risk sending big space missions instead of swarms of CubeSats? Can NASA protect future Mars astronauts from radiation with EM shielding? How close are we to discovering our first exomoon? And in our Q&A Plus version, which sci-fi tech is the closest to becoming a reality? Answering all this and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Ramon Martinez, if we ever get to Mars, does NASA plan to send three electromagnetic rockets to land first to protect the astronauts? No. Um, you know, people have proposed that a good way to protect astronauts from space radiation is to use some kind of electromagnetic field. You know, the Earth is surrounded by a giant magnetosphere that protects us from the radiation. So why not do the same thing? Um, build our own. And the problem is, is that always the energy cost to build some kind of protective field is greater than if you just sent dumb mass, if you just sent lead shielding, that would be a more efficient use of the of the mass and energy. And so so far, nobody's been able to figure out to crack this problem and people have proposed it. And like I've done tons of reporting, I've done tons of interviews here on this channel, with people proposing to build electromagnetic shielding. And the answer always comes out as it's just not worth it, that it's, it's more efficient to just send more mass, send lead, send metal, and that keeps your astronauts protected. So no, no, there are no plans right now. What will happen astronauts will go to Mars, uh, they'll spend nine months in transit to Mars, they'll get 200 times the radiation dose than what you get on the surface of the Earth, they'll walk around on the surface of Mars, then they'll only get like a lower dose, but still much higher than what you get on Earth, and then back into space, nine more months, high radiation load, and then come back to Earth. And hopefully they won't get cancer. First Ninja, why don't we have 1000s of dirt cheap cube satellites orbiting every planet in the solar system? Why place all bets on single probes when we could have swarms of satellites? Yeah, CubeSats are a revolution in space exploration. And it's it's kind of amazing how much of a sensor package and solar power generation and navigation systems and communication that you can pack into this tiny little spacecraft, like something you could hold in your hand is capable of doing a tremendous amount of scientific work. And they have a real role here in doing Earth science. There's plenty of CubeSats that are launching every year orbiting around the Earth. And CubeSats have actually been sent to other places, to Mars, um, asteroids, and uh, and they work really well. So a good example is when Perseverance went to Mars, it also went with two CubeSats, Marco, and their job was to communicate back home. And so even though they were very small, they were able to actually send messages to and from Mars, and demonstrated that this is this is possible. So on the one hand, you're exactly right, that there could be CubeSats sent to many different places in the solar system, and they would be very powerful, very effective. And part of it is that you need a little bit more in uh, infrastructure. So, uh, you know, these CubeSats are very small, their transmitter is very small. And so you require a much larger dish on Earth to be able to receive their signals. When you have much larger spacecraft, they can have much larger transmitters. And so the receiver on Earth can be smaller. And so if you get to this place where we have more infrastructure, say we've got like a big transmitter that's in orbit around Mars, and then you have all these CubeSats that are orbiting around, they're sending their data to the transmitter, and then the transmitter is relaying it back to Earth, that would make sense. And you can imagine something at Jupiter and then something at Saturn, that we need more of this infrastructure. But the other part is that some of the scientific instruments that we want to be able to send to other worlds are just big and power hungry. Um, you know, while a CubeSat might weigh a couple of kilograms, something you could hold in your hand, maybe 30 kilograms at the most, you know, some of the flagship spacecraft that have gone to other worlds are in the 1000s of kilograms. You know, if you want to send a Uranus probe with a lander or with some kind of atmosphere probe, you're looking at 3000 kilograms, 4000, like it's a heavy load to take to get all of these instruments, a big high quality camera, um, perhaps a synthetic aperture radar of mass spectrometer, like there's a lot of, of heavy instruments that you want to do. And then they all require power, they require uh, some kind of, you know, a nuclear RTG to be able to power all that and that weighs a lot. So there is definitely a lot of room for us to send CubeSats to other worlds. But 
Uh, there's also a need for these larger flagship missions. And, you know, as we get more infrastructure in the solar system, then more CubeSats make sense. J Bell, Fraser, I am fascinated by space science, but have never had any interest at all in the topic of life beyond Earth. In fact, I quickly lose interest when it's mentioned. Is this typical? I don't think that's typical. But I can see how it has nothing to do with space science, sort of. I'm haunted by the question about whether or not we're alone in the universe. I think it is the most profound question that humanity can ask. Um, you know, other people ask, you know, is there, you know, what is the purpose of life? Is there, you know, what happens when you die? Where do the universe come from? I don't care about any of those questions. Um, but I want to know if we're alone in the universe. You know, and this is what uh, Arthur C. Clarke said, right? Two possibilities exist. Either we are alone in the universe or we're not. And either possibility is terrifying. If we are alone in the universe, then life formed on this one world in this one corner of this giant, vast universe, and then evolved an intelligent civilization, and maybe we'll screw it up, and then the sun will blow it out and wipe out all life on Earth, and then the all life in the universe will be extinguished. And it was on our watch, right? It was our fault uh, that we didn't get our act together and get off this planet and spread life into the universe. The other possibility is that life is everywhere. Um, and and that's, you know, weird and kind of dangerous and sort of scary. And you wonder, like, what do other civilizations intend to do to us? Uh, what are you know, what do they want? So I think those are the very practical questions, but they're also just very philosophically deep questions. And then everything sort of builds on that. Uh, astrobiology, searching for evidence of life, thinking about life on Mars, thinking about life in, um, on, uh, in other star systems. Uh, you know, you're all just kind of scratching away at this deeper, more profound question. But I totally get that it's often a very kind of unanswerable question. We just need to know like, what is the part of it that bothers you? But I personally find it absolutely fascinating. Just end the search, you know, the practical parts of the search when we think about the experiments that are going to other planets, the search for signals coming from other civilizations, the the developments into better telescopes that are going to be able to measure the atmospheres of other planets. Uh, no, I find all this absolutely fascinating. And I think most of the audience does too. Um, and I think it stems from that deeper, profound question. But I think it's perfectly fine to not care. Um, and be fascinated by space itself and just the kicks the, the, the cosmos is huge and has room for all of our thoughts and ponderings, no matter what they are. It's time to shout out all the new $5 patrons and above Steve Hatton, David Williams, Turfy, Richard Carande, Jack Hare, Bird Ralph, Reagan, Kenneth Tasso Taub, KT Boundary, and Tord Ingoff Reistad. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Xander Schnobi, how close are we to discovering exomoons? Also, can moons have moons? So I'll take the second question first, which is can moons have moons? And the answer is theoretically, um, you would need to have the exact right distance between the planet and its large moon. And then you could then have a small moon orbiting around that large moon. And there's only really one place in the solar system where you could have moons having moons, and that would be in Neptune. So if you had Neptune, and you had a moon that was far enough away from Neptune, just holding within the hill sphere of Neptune, it's, in other words, it was orbiting Neptune, and didn't want to go and orbit the sun, then you could have moons around that moon, and they would remain stable for long periods of time. There's not a lot of places that, you know, if you're too close to Jupiter, Jupiter's going to try to steal your moon moons, or Saturn, uh, it's really you have to get far out away from Jupiter before these things can be stable. The first part of your question was how close are we to discovering exomoons? We don't know. Uh, so far, there's only been tiny little hints. And in fact, David Kipping from the Cool Worlds channel, his day job is that he is trying to search for exomoons and other exoplanets. And he was recently awarded time on James Webb to search for an exomoon. He got like a lot of time on James Webb to do this. And 
he's gotten the data and he's crunching it right now. And it could very well be that there is the discovery of exomoons in that study. I've done a long interview with David Kipping about this proposed research before he got time. And then also I did a follow up with him after he got time. And so, uh, you know, I've done if you do a search on my channel for David Kipping, uh, you should be able to see those interviews. Jamie Doe, I've been researching solar gravitational lensing combined with interferometers. Is anyone looking into combining these two ideas? They naturally would go together well. Uh, solar gravitational lens, that's where you use the power of the sun's um, gravity to act like a natural lens that allows you to see, you know, megapixel images of exoplanets with a relatively small telescope. And interferometers give you a virtual telescope based on the baseline, the separation of your two telescopes. And so if you could put an interferometer into the solar gravitational lens, that would be even better than just a single telescope, but it would also be more complicated. You have to send two spacecraft and they would have to get themselves perfectly aligned. And what if one of them doesn't work? So interferometers are always better. <laughs> And yet they're very complicated and very difficult to do. That's what we have no interferometers in space yet. So one thing at a time, I think, is the way this is going to work. Mendal, we only have one visible light interferometer telescope on Earth, right? I think we have two, but there may be more that I'm not aware of. The one that I am familiar with is called Chara, the Center for High Angular Resolution Astronomy. And this is an array in Mount Wilson, California. And it is six one meter telescopes. And they're separated so that they act like a single telescope that is 330 meters across. And this is really tricky work to do um, in the in the optical in the visible wavelengths, you know, most of the interferometers that are out there are in radio waves like the um, the event horizon telescope or in infrared like the very large telescope or the Keck interferometer that these those wavelengths are uh, very forgiving. But there is one optical interferometer. And so it's been able to do things like observe the surfaces of various stars, um, and even resolve more than a single pixel on an exoplanet. So, uh, you know, it's a great proof of concept, it's been operating for decades. And I guess you know, people have have thought about other optical interferometers and and just haven't found that it's worth the effort and energy. But I've done a bunch of interviews about the potential for optical interferometers, both on the surface of the Earth, as well as in space and even on the moon. And so people are thinking about what the future of optical interferometry might be. The the downside of like, something like Chara, even though it has a the equivalent the resolution of a gigantic 300 plus meter telescope, um, it only has the light collecting capacity of six one meter telescopes. And so that is very small. And so it's able to see very bright objects like stars, but not the fainter objects that you would really like to get that additional resolution on Christopher Brummett, do you think that the Canadian Space Agency will step up in funding and scope now that we see our poor friends at NASA are getting their budgets gutted? I don't think so. Unfortunately, Canada has a limited budget, you know, the size of our economy is a fraction of what the US is. And we can only afford to spend so much on space science. You know, we do have a Canadian Space Agency, and we do develop various missions, we contributed one instrument to James Webb, we're developing a lunar rover. Obviously, we put robotic arms on on everything, um, and contribute astronauts to to fly, and other missions and contributions. And I think that, you know, no matter what happens moving forward, I think we're gonna have a very tight integration with the United States and continue to participate in whatever forms of, of international cooperation are going to happen, you know, we're just not a big enough country to be able to uh, go our own way. I could definitely see a tighter integration with us and the European Space Agency, though, um, you know, depending on on who needs us, you know, there's a lot of amazing scientific work that's being done at Canadian universities, uh, a lot of great aerospace uh, programs that are putting out researchers who are working on difficult challenges, and they're going to need to put their their knowledge and expertise to work. And if budgets are tight in the US, or if you know, the various missions that we want to collaborate on aren't working, then I can totally see us getting more involved in stuff happening with Europe or China, right, or India. 
Uh, you know, India has a really vibrant space program. They've got a lot of really interesting things that are going on. So, you know, it's a big world. And I think there's a lot of opportunities out there for us to get involved. Web Fiji. If we keep going in a direction in space, assuming escape velocity speeds, will we eventually hit something? Not necessarily. Uh, when we when you look up into space and you see the stars and you see the galaxies, and if you have the right instruments, you see the cosmic microwave background radiation, you are seeing the light that has been traveling for 13.8 billion years, and it didn't hit anything. It made that entire journey, it dodged every single planet, every star, every piece of dust, and it got to your detector or to your eyeball. So same thing, if you took off from some location and you traveled in one direction, uh, you could absolutely go forever and never run into anything. Silas Miller, is the sun made of the same elements and minerals as the planets? Yes, uh, the sun is mostly made of hydrogen and helium. The sun is 99.8% of the solar system, right? We are just a rounding error, including Jupiter, like most of it is Jupiter, and then we're a rounding error. But while the sun is hydrogen and helium, it also has many times the mass of the earth in every single thing that the earth has many more times the mass of the earth in oxygen and nitrogen and carbon and uranium and iron and all of that. It's just that it also has all of that hydrogen and helium. And that's the thing that the Earth doesn't have. Same thing with Jupiter, like there's something like 15 times the mass of Earth of metals inside Jupiter. It's just that the you know, Jupiter is gigantic 318 times the mass of the Earth. So everything the Earth has is in the sun, it's just under incredible heat and pressure and completely inaccessible. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call it Q&A Plus. And this week's bonus question, what sci-fi tech is the closest to becoming a reality? And I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, those are all the questions that we had for this episode. Thank you everyone who put your questions into the YouTube comments and everybody who joined us for the live show. We record the live show every Monday at 5 p.m. somewhere in the world. Uh, the time changes every week, you'll understand. But there will be a link to the next event here on the channel somewhere. And it's two hours long, we get to dozens and dozens of questions, a lot of back and forth. It's a lot of fun. Now I'm going to chat about some new anime that I've been watching. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew M. Gross, Bradley Griffin, Brian Bodie, Caridwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bailock, Cy Nelson, David Gilton, David Matz, Dustin Cable, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hans Schultz, Hudson Moore, Jay Graves, James Clark, Jeremy Madden, Jim Berg, Jordan Young, Marcel Smits, Michael Purcell, Modso, Paul Robach, Brian Kaidu, Robeck, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fowler Munley, Vlad Shiplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all our patrons. All your support means the universe to us. So I want to share some anime that I have been watching uh, on the various streaming services. These are all available on Netflix, actually. So uh, the first one is Pantheon, which is actually about uh, sort of a near future artificial intelligence, brain uploading and scanning. And I watched the first season uh, like a couple of years ago. And then they've got a second season now and all of it is available on Netflix. And it's great. It's a fairly realistic understanding of what a very intelligent artificial intelligence could do what artificial super intelligence might feel like in the coming future and what we could do to try and stop it. Uh, the next show is called blood of Zeus. And this is made by the same people that make the Castlevania series. And this is about a uh, sort of a battle between the gods in Greek mythology. And so if you've ever been into Greek mythology, like I think we all have, um, this is good. And then the last one is called Orb on the movements of the Earth. And this is such a strange show. Um, it's anime about heliocentrists versus geocentrists in what is like Renaissance times or times of the Inquisition in Europe. And as people are deciding to become astronomers and trying to decide whether they should be willing to accept the idea that the Earth is at the center of the universe, or whether the sun is at the center of the universe. And um, you know, a, bu a bunch of of you recommended this thing to me, and I didn't even know it was there. And then I went searching for it. And then I found it.
found it and I watched it and it's, it's good. Now, all three of my recommendations are for adults. They are not for kids. They are definitely uh, very mature. Uh, there's blood, gore, awful things happening to people, torture. So it's, you know, these are not like um, Dr. Stone. Uh, but they're all good in their own way. So definitely check them out and keep your recommendations coming for shows that you've been watching. All right, we'll see you next time.